good afternoon or, or evening or good morning, depending on where in the world you're joining us from. Uh, I'm Alex Stark. I'm a senior researcher at New America, and I'm thrilled to be welcoming you to this event today. So it's the second in a series that we're co-hosting with the Bridging the Gap Project, whose mission is to promote scholarly contributions to public debate and decision-making on global challenges and US foreign policy. And our aim through this partnership is to really dig into the substance and the policy implications of cutting edge new research in the field and to bring it to a wider audience. And so we're, we're just thrilled to be working with them uh, on this. Today, we're going to be doing just that with a talk by Tom Long. I'm going to turn it over now to our moderator, uh, Jim Goldgeier, who's a senior advisor of Bridging the Gap. Uh, and among many other illustrious roles that he has held uh, in the past and currently, he's a Robert Bosch Senior Visiting Fellow at the Brookings Institution and a Professor of International Relations at the School of International Service at American University, where he served as Dean from 2011 to 2017. So thanks so much, everyone, and take it away, Jim. Thanks so much, Alex, and Bridging the Gap, so excited to be able to partner with New America on this initiative and really grateful to Alex and to Heather Hurlburt for that opportunity to partner. And uh, we are showcasing uh, a new release in the Oxford University Press Bridging the Gap book series, and that is Tom Long's A Small State's Guide to Influence in World Politics. And just wonderful to welcome Tom, as well as two other panelists uh, who work on important small state initiatives Emily Wilkinson and Wazim Mola. Uh, Tom is an Associate Professor of Politics and International Studies at the University of Warwick. Wazim is Assistant Director of the Caribbean Initiative at the Atlantic Council's Adrian Arsht Latin America Center and non-resident scholar at Florida International University's Jack D. Gordon Institute for Public Policy. And Emily's a Senior Research Fellow at ODI, a Director of the Resilient and Sustainable Islands Initiative and Chief Scientific Advisor of the Climate Resilience Execution Agency for Dominica. So just welcome to the panel and, and congratulations, Tom, again on the book. It's, it's a great and much needed read. Thank you. And as you point out, when we study international relations, we're often taught to study the great powers. I'm particularly mindful of that because I did my PhD at UC Berkeley and Ken Waltz uh, was on my dissertation committee and uh, took his classes on international relations and that's what we focused on we focused on the great powers and you know his argument that they dominate and shape the international system is why we did that but as you point out in your book the vast majority of states are small states and your book does a great job showing that these states aren't just the objects of great power politics but these states can have influence and you walk us through security issues economic issues environmental issues and it's particularly great the way you do these comparisons with showing why some states have been more effective than others in trying to get what they want um, in the international system. So let's just start by just saying, just in addition to you know, putting more uh, international studies attention on these countries, um, what do you consider to be some of the most important takeaways for scholars and policymakers from this book? Thank you um, so much, Jim, for this invitation to the teams at, at New America and Bridging the Gap for making this happen, and also to Azim and Emily for joining us, and and for everyone, uh, to everyone who is who is watching. So uh, to to think about some of the takeaways for this book, first of all, exactly as 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 you said, Jim, sort of the overarching point is is simple, which is that small states. But also, I think the dynamics of asymmetrical relations, the relationships between uh, large and small states, deserve much more attention than they often often receive. And you know, as your anecdote about uh, about Kenneth Waltz points out, you know, I think particularly when we think about the way that international relations is taught and the way that the Anglo-American IR canon has been constructed, small states are mostly invisible. I mean, I don't want to overstate that point. Of course, there is a lot of, of research and, and, and great research on these questions, but often it's sort of relegated to, to niche discussions. So, you know, I want to, I guess, start by, by making a case for why I think small states matter to, to IR and then uh, give a few takeaways for, for policy 
policymakers as well. So I, I guess, first of all, kind of following Waltz's uh, influential example, the, the, the field's case selection has been overly focused on, on great powers. And, you know, great powers are obviously very important, but they're also uh, by their nature kind of outliers. And so this has really skewed the basis of, of IR's, uh, IR's theorizing. So looking at small states is, is crucial for diversifying the empirical basis of IR and for developing more uh, sort of comprehensive uh, international relations theory. That's true if we think about small states as kind of units of analysis, but what I'm, I'm going to argue is that we actually need to think about, about relationships. And so when we think about international relationships, it's a small portion of those relationships that are kind of small, that are sort of symmetrical relations amongst great powers. Instead, many more of those relationships are, are asymmetrical. And, and I think that, that, really, um, that really matters for how we understand international relations. Secondly, you know, uh, and this is another place where I would sort of diverge from that structural reading of, of international politics, is that policymakers care a lot about small states and asymmetrical relationships. If we look at the, the policymakers, even in great powers, they dedicate a lot of time and attention and resources to small states, often small states kind of in their, in their geographical vicinity. A third reason is that small states have been called sort of a canary in the coal mine. Uh, and that's true, and this is something that, that certainly I think Emily can add quite a lot to and Nassim as well, but that's certainly true when we think about the, the effects of, of climate change on small island developing states, but it's also true when we think about questions of international order. Um, when international order starts to change or norms, international norms around, say, sovereignty or participation or, uh, or territorial conquest, if those norms begin to erode, it's often going to be small states who, who notice it first. Um, so a related message for IR and how we study IR is, is kind of to take asymmetry seriously and to think about the roles of smaller actors and how they constitute relationships and international order. Um, there's a need to go beyond this idea of, of great power as a system determining. And, and so I'd say that the, the book really tries to think about power and influence in, in more uh, nuanced ways. Finally, the final point about uh, about the kind of how we study IR, this book is obviously positioned in the literature on small states, and there is a lot of work on that. And I've incurred a lot of a lot of debts to smaller to scholars who work on small states. Um, however, the work on small states has often been kind of scattered for a long time. Uh, it was very heavily focused on uh, on on European small states, um, following uh, Peter Katzenstein's example, his influential early work on this. Um, that's been changing and there is uh, a growing body of, of literature on small states around the world. But a lot of times this has led to, to kind of limited theoretical uh, accumulation and theory building because small states, when we think of, about the small state as, as a category, that's been, that includes so many states that are so different, different geographies, different levels of development. Obviously there's no clear cut definition in terms of, of, of what the size of a small state is. And that's made it really hard to develop theories of small state behavior. So to that literature, this book's kind of takeaway and contribution is to shift from looking at uh, small states as kind of small like units uh, and to look at patterns in relationships instead. Um, and to do that, looking across diverse regions and, and issues. Um, for policymakers, the book's takeaways are, are sort of set on, on two levels. First, there's, uh, there's a, a broader takeaway, um, which is that, uh, which is about how small states gain influence. And that's that uh, relationship and context really matters. That small states influence needs to be seen in light of small states specific goals. Um, small states are obviously definitely not always going to win but that when we look at small states influence in this light, there are more opportunities uh, than, than might uh, appear at first glance. 
kind of more concretely, and this is really the set of tools that the book tries to, to provide for, uh, for policymakers, the book sets out this sort of these analytical tools um, that depart from a couple of premises. The, the, the first is that is, is this idea about small states goals and assessing them concretely uh, in terms of what small states are trying to achieve instead of assuming that small states have goals that are similar to larger states, that is the pursuit of power or, or perhaps autonomy. Um, so thinking about small states goals in that way. Secondly, uh, that small states uh, goals and their international positions are often heavily shaped by a handful of relationships and that those relationships are often the most, the, the most salient ones are, are often asymmetrical. So by assessing those relationships and thinking about the dynamics of asymmetry, um, policymakers can better uh, identify patterns of opportunities and, and constraints. So those tools focus on kind of uh, a, a, what I refer to as a scorecard um, that can be used to assess a particular case. And cases in this book are, try, I, I tried to construct them in a way that I, I hope is kind of um, useful to, to, to policymakers, um, which is that they are focused not on kind of as a, one particular small state trying to achieve influence on, on everything, but instead uh, the pursuit of a, of a particular goal in particular relationships. So looking at those cases, the scorecard hopefully allows policymakers to assess uh, what type of case they're in, in a sense, and what kinds of, of strategies might, might apply in that type of case. Uh, I focus on the degree of policy divergence, how salient this issue is, particularly uh, for kind of re relevant larger powers, though that could also be applied uh, to, to international organizations. And third, how cohesive are the preferences of different states in, in that case? Looking across those factors, uh, the, the book offers a, a typological theory, kind of eight different types of cases, uh, and then offers some, some, uh, some, some explanations about opportunities and constraints in those cases, and what types of strategies might be most effectively pursued uh, depending on, on the type of, of case. That's great, thank you so much. So, so Emily and Wazim, just wanted to turn to you here and just ask how the kinds of things that Tom has done in this book, how, does, how do these things help you with the work you're each doing on small state policies? What, what are sort of the things that, that as you read as you read the book that you might have thought to yourself, oh, this is a useful thing for me, uh, for my own work as I move forward. Emily, maybe we'll start with you. Thanks very much. Um, and thanks, thanks, Tom, for um, sharing the book and advanced copy with me. And I very much enjoyed reading it. Um, I think the first thing to say is it kind of, it, it was great to read and um, found it very affirming of um, the kind of approach that we want to take with this resilient and sustainable islands initiative, which is um, looking at um, the relationship between, we're focused particularly on small island developing states um, and the, in, the international system, um, particularly um, access to finance, um, the debt situation and looking at SIDS in that context and not so much putting um, the, the sort of blame, if you like, of um, why SIDS are not able to respond to the difficult situation in which they find them, particularly in the context of climate change, by Im making improvements in their own domestic governance. So it's often, um, there's, there's quite a, uh, uh, an important focus in, in the literature and in the kind of policy um, arena um, on climate change around national planning, um, nationally driven approaches, um, improving or enhancing their, their capacity to be able to, um, to, to respond to climate change impacts, to develop adaptation plans, to develop kind of resilience agendas, um, as if this could all be, it's, it's all entirely dependent on the will and the, uh, the sort of, um, the, the, their own ability to, to, to implement the kind of reforms that are needed. Um, and what we want to do through the initiative is put a lot more emphasis on that kind of relational element. So it was very, um, 
very encouraging to to read your book and to to see that that kind of emphasis really um and also the acknowledgement that they um that SIDS can have um, influence and, and you, you include the example in there of the influence that they were able to have on the climate change negotiations through the Alliance of Small Island States, AOSIS, um, which is, I think, a very important case. And they continue to do so. AOSIS continues to be a really important force within the climate change negotiations. Um, and um, I would say even has a kind of leadership role for other developing countries as well, um, who will would kind of join in, have similar agendas and similar, um, want to see similar results come out of, uh, out of the climate change negotiations, including um, now what is very current, which is um, uh, some kind of financing facility to compensate countries for the loss and damage, which um, they will have experienced as a result of climate change. So that's an, an area which um, um, SIDS are really leading um, the, the and pushing for um, and will continue, I think, to, to be extremely influential. So, um, yeah, I very much sort of enjoy, enjoyed that, that focus um, and sort of taking it away perhaps from, you know, the individual um, capacities that they might have or trying to kind of pull out, um, yeah, the, the sort of... Um, the attributes of uh, of a particular small state, and and then trying to kind of replicate that, which I think um, you know sometimes um, people working in the field of kind of climate policy will, would tend to do, and rather looking more at this kind of um, the influence they can have through their relationships um, uh, with 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 large states, um, but also with these um, international um, organizations and, and institutions. Um, so I. I probably have more to say, but I'll, yeah, right. uh, uh, I'll, stop, I'll stop there. Well, actually, before I turn to Wazim, the, your last remark, I, I had wanted to follow up with you, so I, I think I'll do this now, which is, um, I mean, one of the things that Tom does in the book is he shows the, the ways in which, I mean, st small states, I mean, you know, they're sort of multi-pronged strategies. I mean, they're, they're, they've got bilateral relationships with particular major powers, but they also, of course, are working through international organizations and they're they're working together through international organizations and international negotiation processes and just curious your take sort of how you how you see that that effort of trying to trying to pursue these different kinds of relationships and and man and how those come together and interrelate yeah i mean i think i think they very much so we see different kinds of strategies. I mean, the, it, within these, you know, the climate change negotiations, it's definitely um, bringing together that kind of group to be able to kind of all speak with a collective voice on something which affects, you know, the, the SIDS um, in a common way. Um, but I think, you know, the, the, we can also see within that kind of leadership roles, um, different small island developing states, we've seen um, um, political figures, leaders who have had a particularly strong voice in that um, arena who have been very influential. And I think um, also kind of um, improve the, the, the voice of SIDS in the international arena and particularly uh, around climate change, which I think is, is something that I didn't see happen before. So you know, the, some of you know, I suppose, kind of international figures with real leadership on climate change agenda come from small island developing states. Um, and, and people um, are beginning to kind of recognize how important that is. Um, so how, how this all comes together, I mean, I think it's, it's, it's very much thinking about um, how can we, or something that I'm very interested in is how can we kind of decolonize the, the relationships between small island developing states and some of the kind of larger economies and certainly kind of developed countries, advanced economies. Um, so whether it's, you know, in, in terms of kind of um, trade negotiations, WTO relations, whether it's um, the um, United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, um, whether it's in relation to um, the eligibility criteria for accessing um, official development assistance across all of these arenas, um, we need to be thinking more about, or policy um, makers need to be thinking more about uh, how to support SIDS in achieving their own objectives and what a decolonized relationship would look like. And that's something that certainly 
Resi is um, seeking to, um, well, we're having a lot of discussions with um, the UK government around, um, and this is a, you know, a, an agenda that's very close to my heart. And so I think that's one way of thinking about how that brings it all together, because certainly from a UK perspective, a lot of small island developing states are former colonies. That's one thing that they have in common. Um, and that that very much kind of um, helps, to, helps us to understand the, some of the common um, characteristics of, of these, um, of small states and um, the ones that we that we are um, particularly interested in, um, it helps us to understand their vulnerabilities. It helps us to understand the difficulties that they have engaging with the international system, um, and helps us to understand their, to some extent, their kind of um, the, the 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 sort of physical vulnerability and exposure to external shocks, as well as um, their kind of. Um, yeah, the, the, the particular um, sort of situation that they're in at being at the kind of front line of, 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 of climate change impacts, as, as Tom mentioned. So I think that for me, that's one, um, one way of thinking about um, all of these relationships and, and how to kind of um, move towards a, um, a kind of a system that, that favors small states um, and is supportive of their, of their own objectives. That's great, thank you. So Wazim, turning to you for for sort of any, any big takeaways that you have for the kind of work you do. And I'm particularly interested, Tom, one of the things Tom does in the book is to show there, where there are cases where small states are able to play off the great powers against each other. Um, Djibouti, for example, in the book, is a very interesting discussion there. And just given your work on China and Latin America, just curious how you see that, um, you know, for countries that are, that are looking to, um, to try to, play off the, the, the China-US competition in Latin America, how that manifests itself for you? Yeah, I, I mean, that's a great question. And first, you know, thank you to New America and the Bridging the Gap book series for the invitation um, to speak here. And, and Tom, uh, it's a fantastic book. Um, you know, I'll put, you know, quickly putting my Caribbean hat on, being from the region, just seeing, you know, this type of book and showing the type of influence that we can have on the world and, and, and more particularly with you know, relationships with great powers, I think is it's really important to highlight. Um, one quick thing I want to touch on that you mentioned, the canary in the coal mine sort of aspect is, you know, Caribbean countries and its leaders, and uh, even not at the leader level, just in general, are, are very quick to sort of talk about the effects of global events um, or, or regional events in different parts of the world. Uh, climate change for sure is one, but the pandemic, very early on, we saw Caribbean leaders sort of reframing the conversation of the pandemic to uh, in a similar way they did with climate change it being a moral imperative but you know reframing it in a way you know going from that aspect and saying look um you know especially the caribbean and its strategic location in the atlantic ocean saying look if we don't solve these issues the effects of the pandemic you know it's going to affect you know the united states it's going to create instability which like affects the you know drug trafficking to europe and really going using global stages to sort of reformulate the sort of the conversation about the pandemic in, in itself, um, which I thought was really impactful. And I really picked up on that um, in, in the book. Um, the other thing is sort of, you know, looking at how they, you know, uh, you mentioned these sort of playing, you know, great powers off each other, you know, trying to get vaccines. Um, a lot of the conversation was about US and China, but something that I noticed from Caribbean countries is it wasn't just US and China. The foreign policy calculus for the small states is, Yes, there's, there's fewer relationships that they have, right? The US would have relationships with more than 100 countries and the you know, Caribbean countries maybe 20 to 30, but their foreign po policy calculus is, is much broader. So the US and China, yes, but then they're also looking at countries in Africa, they're looking at India, they're looking at the UK as different ways to play these countries off each other, Canada as well. You know, we saw you know, you know, certain countries in the Caribbean first approach China first approached India for vaccines when they had approached the United States and weren't getting it. Then they, you know, they welcomed lots of Sinopharm vaccines, which then they sort of, uh, you know, used a, a media, media spectacle, right? You know, having, you know, being across national media, prime ministers going to the airports and, you know, receiving these vaccines. And, you know, that had an influence in how the U.S. had to mobilize its own vaccine resources to, you know, speed up the, the amount of time it takes to sort of ship them to the country. And it actually, in many ways, you know, I wouldn't say forced, but it helped the U.S. move from a multilateral approach, really, to start, you know, using bilateral donations, it's specifically in the Caribbean, and specifically with some countries in Latin America. We saw it very early on with 
with Mexico. Um, and then some really key points that I saw that I took from this book, you know, I thought was really interesting is seeing the influence of small states, particularly from the Caribbean in real time, as I was reading this. Um, I was in Barbados last week um, for a, a discussion on a financial access roundtable. That was a uh, part of a congressional delegation to Barbados, you know, it had several CARICOM heads there. And what was interesting is that that discussion, right, on de-risking, which is uh, one that the U.S. and U.S. banks never want to really talk about, materialized because of Caribbean leaders in 2019 going to Washington, meeting with several members of Congress, sitting in these offices, explaining the de-risking issue, but doing it in a way that describes how this issue affects U.S. interests. Um, so framing this issue and how it affects U.S. interests a couple of years later leads to a financial access roundtable in Barbados with U.S. banks and members of Congress now paying particular attention to a region that they oftentimes neglect. Um, and then the final thing that I'll mention is, you know, we talk, we, 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 at least in the Caribbean, we talk a lot about sort of CARICOM integration, economic integration. Something that this book has really brought to my attention is what are some of the challenges that the CARICOM countries themselves are facing in their own integration, right? Um, you, we talk about this asymmetrical relationships and looking at relational wise, it's maybe, maybe there is a reason that countries like Antigua and Dominica and St. Vincent don't always align foreign policies or align their economic policies with a country like Jamaica, which relative to the United States has a small economy, but relative to Antigua is a much bigger economy. And this can lead to several integration challenges that we see in CARICOM and why, you know, we see these, yes, we see these big collective statements on things like climate change and the pandemic, but when it comes to sort of, you know, uh, you know, getting rid of trade barriers, for example, that's not exactly the case. So I think it, this book really does help us look at a very nuanced level, even in smaller regions, and not to just sort of generalize and say, okay, Caribbean countries are all small, they're all going to vote together. That's not exactly the case. You look at OES voting records, you look at UN voting records most recently when it comes to sort of Russia's war in the Ukraine, you know, we're seeing these sort of discrepancies. And I think this book is really helping us understand why that's the case. Right. Well, Tom, you may want to respond to, to more of what Emily and Wazim have been talking about. But since Wazim raised the issue of Russia's war against Ukraine, I do want to ask you, uh, you know, I mean, a, a, a small state's nightmare is to have uh, a large neighbor uh, invade it and try to topple its government or try to take its territory. And um, this war is is horrific. Um, and we've seen varied reactions, as Wazim was just noting, there are varied reactions to it across the world. And I think in the US, a lot of our focus has been on the unity of the Euro-Atlantic community and um, the, the way that the NATO, NATO has responded. But we have seen variation in reaction, especially across the global South. Um, and, uh, you know, just curious why some countries seem so ambivalent uh, about siding with those countries that feel like, you know, Ukraine needs every amount of help it can get to defend itself against this brutality. Yeah, no, I, th I mean, I think that's, that's, that's a, a fascinating question, because the sort of the canary in the coal mine argument that I enunciated and sort of the role of those international norms on one level one, would point to those norms and say, small states should be the strongest defender of uh, the strongest defenders of, of norms on territorial integrity, for for example, um, precisely because uh, be, because they they lack uh, capabilities to defend themselves from a great power or great power invasion on on their own. However, this is where I think the sort of moving away from treating small states as as uh, as a category across which we should expect uniform behaviors and putting small states in the context of their own uh, of their relationships is is really important um and when you do that you might start to to see some different features of uh of of small states responses to to this crisis so some of those might be concerns about um about other kind of international norms a lot of small states uh, are concerned about the use of economic statecraft, for example, and the way that that could that that could uh, that that could affect them, uh, being the targets of sanctions, for example. Um, but they also, of course, have varied relationships with the states involved, whether that's Russia directly, 
um, or or whether that's that's with uh, or whether that's with with China, which has also, of course, had a more um, ambivalent to supportive uh, attitude to, to Russia. But th there's another aspect that I think um, where, where I think thinking about asymmetry is 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 really important to, to understanding this uh, the this this conflict, which is that the Russia's invasion of Ukraine has often been read, and we've spent a lot of time talking about it in terms of Russia-NATO relations. Um, and that's understandable given the, the concern about, uh, about nuclear escalation. Um, but also when we think about, uh, about the Russian-Ukrainian relationship as, a, as asymmetrical, I think we can start to understand a lot of the patterns of misperceptions that have existed in that relationship, where, you know, for a large power like Russia in this case, security as it under understands it is often about deference from, uh, from the small state, right? But to the smaller state, and Ukraine is, you know, not, not a typical small state by by any sense, but um, but but to the smaller state, the security is existential. Um, and so this leads to, to really different uh, patterns of perception of the same asymmetrical relationship. The other aspect that, that I think is worth highlighting is uh, it shows looking at, at Ukraine's response, obviously its own um, resolve and capacities have, have been important, um, but it's also been very effective in, uh, in, in turning to relationships with other powers. Right. Uh, that is, it has not been a passive recipient of, of aid from NATO. It has not been a, a passive recipient of sort of uh, outside narratives about the about the Russian invasion. It has been uh, really active in shaping those relationships, in shaping that narrative, and in uh, using those relationships to to derive and bolster its own uh, capabilities to to resist the the, the invasion. Um, I, there is an audience question that I want to turn to in a second, but um, just um, sticking on this point for a minute, just curious, Emily, as you think about resilience and you think about um, the, the countries that you work with and, and their, their need to have something done about climate change, I mean, one of the features of this war, at least within Europe, is uh, talk about reducing dependence on Russian energy supplies and potentially, you know, shifting the way Europe thinks about energy in, in ways that might actually have um, beneficial impact for, uh, for the, the future contours of and trajectory of climate change. And just curious whether sort of, as you look at this, you know, sort of ways in which countries that really need relief from the impact of climate change uh, may end up having some hope that, that out of this war that, that Europe's behavior at least might change with respect to the use of fossil fuels. Yeah, I mean, that would be, um, that would be great. <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure we're quite at the um, I'm, I'm not sure that leaders within Europe are, are quite ready to take those kind of decisions. I mean, the UK has just released an energy uh, policy, which is much more focused on um, nuclear energy than I think any of us working in the sector um, expected, um, which um, is both problematic, you know, as a, as a short term strategy to in terms of reducing uh, dependence on oil, um, putting pressure on Russia. Not that the UK is um, hugely dependent on on oil or gas from Russia, but um, um, but it doesn't it doesn't meet the kind of longer term um, climate mitigation or reducing um, uh, 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 reducing greenhouse gas emission goals either. Um, so I don't think we're sort of seeing um, we're not seeing the kind of opportunity being taken up. Um, to really accelerate those investments, which um, it could be, and I'm, I, I'm still not entirely clear why there isn't the kind of right, um, we're not in the right kind of political moment um, to take those kind of decisions. I think it's, you know, it, it's certainly related to the fact that we're coming out of, off the kind of um, a huge amount of, of, of government spending and increasing debt um, due to the pandemic. And that's, um, that's making things, you know, difficult for governments who want to, um, who do have kind of ambitious agendas around um, renewable energy and um, uh, achieving um, net 
zero carbon emissions. But um, yeah, I think I think you know it could be a great opportunity. But I think the same thing was said about you know, during the pandemic as well about building back better, right? Um, and it didn't really materialize in the US either um, as a as a set of really kind of coherent and ambitious policies. I think the other thing is, of course, um, you know, in the meantime. Um, what um, small island developing states really need, as well as obviously the commitments um, uh, uh, around renewable energy, is 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 the this you know the commitment to spend more in helping them to adapt and um, to kind of absorb the impacts of climate change. And again, I don't think it's a particularly conducive environment to increasing those budgets. Um, but you know, I, I, we live in a world where there is it, you know there isn't isn't a choice anymore it's not you know there's not a perfect moment and it can't it's not one thing or the other but hopefully you know it will with all of this going on it won't drown out those voices and one thing I just wanted to mention in relation to that interestingly in the UK and we do see it in other countries as well is that um, bringing together the kind of foreign policy and development agendas and we saw a merger a year before last of the um of our uh, Department for International Development and the Foreign Office into kind of one uh, one department um, is that there's actually that's actually brought about a kind of greater interest um, in in from the UK government in small island developing states because as a foreign policy issue there's more potential kind of interest in small states um, through the kind of opportunity the sort of positive relationship that the UK can have. Um, with, um, you know, particularly former colonies, islands in the Pacific and, and Caribbean, and the kind of soft power that that can generate and trading relationships post Brexit and um, other kind of opportunities as the Foreign Office would see it, um, which is not not definitely not um, what we were seeing before from the Department for International Development as a separate unit who were you know, really not interested in small countries with small populations, um, in terms of their kind of the kinds of targets that are important to a, de a development department, which is build the resilience of X million people or, or, or some such goal, um, in which case obviously you know, small states um, are not going to help them much in achieving those goals. Um, so we're seeing a lot more interest now, in, in fact, um, despite um, the, the, the current climate and um, and, and, and the war in the Ukraine, there is actually growing interest um, in, from this smallish island in, in other um, islands around the world. So Tom, there's a question here from Anne. When does a small state stop being a state in traditional terms of what constitutes a state? So I'm actually gonna broaden that out and just ask you to talk a little bit about sort of the categories that you use um, and sort of how you, how you, especially as we sort of think about, I mean, there are the, there are the states in the international system that have their seat at the United Nations. Um, there's a country like Taiwan that is able to play a role in certain international organizations, not in others, is recognized by some countries, not others, particularly challenging small states that want to recognize Taiwan, uh, but, you know, um, China uh, puts tremendous pressure on them. Then there are entities like Kurdistan, which, you know, receives support, but um, is not, a, a, you know, a, an independent state, um, is a, you know, as an entity, as a region. I mean, how do we, how do we think conceptually about these issues related to what it is to be a state, what it is to be a small state? Yeah, I mean, obviously, it's sort of it's a, a combined concept in that point where you have to think about stateness and and smallness, um, and, and sort of the the stateness aspect. I'm I'm uh, I'm glad to have this question because that's the aspect that is more often I think taken for granted in this conversation. That is, you know, we uh, we we know what is a state. That is, uh, the certain level of usually international legal recognition is understood to to sort of conferring um, conferring. In statehood, you know the 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 marker today is as, as Jim mentioned, sort of being a member of the United Nations is is seen as as uh, as the the sign that you've made it uh, effectively as 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 a state. But there are these uh, borderline cases, sometimes referred to as sort of de facto states or or quasi states, um, where the state uh, 
often has a lot of what we would consider the domestic attributes of, of statehood. It has a population, a territory, a government, um, et cetera, um, but it has little or no um, international recognition. And I think, you know, from the perspective of thinking about small states, those cases are really interesting because they, uh, they highlight the costs and benefits of sovereignty. Um, that is, a lot of those states uh, or, or quasi-states, de facto states, are working really hard to attain um, international recognition, to get that, that, that sort of um, international um, legitimacy, because it confers upon them a much greater ability to participate uh, in, in international relations. It often opens up different types of, of, uh, of international finance and development finance. And uh, despite what we see uh, happening in, in Ukraine now, uh, it's linked to a very high level of what's kind of referred to as extantism. If once you, once you exist as, uh, as, as a state, you usually continue to, to exist um, as, as, as a state. Um, so in the book, I'm mostly talking about states that have that level of international um, recognition. And I talk a little bit about why, why I, I think that that matters. Um, that said, in some other work, I've looked at sort of how these uh, how these de facto states um, engage in relations with one another, and why it is that uh, that that some small states might choose to recognize, say, Taiwan um, in ways that go beyond, I think, the sort of the pure material benefits that Taiwan might try to provide to 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 its allies. Um, just to shift to, to the other aspect of that concept, which is, is smallness, um, the, the idea of smallness and what is a small state is also dealt with in, in, in really different ways, um, both in practice and, and, in, and in IR scholarship. So, you know, there are different definitions of, uh, of what is a small state in diplomatic practice, and they're often very population focused. Um, so, you know, in, in some uh, IOs, that is a population of 1 million or 1.5 million. Um, the UN has a forum on small states that nominally is 10 million, um, the population of 10 million that also includes a few states that are a bit, a bit larger than that. Um, and this is what I kind of think of as the, the category approach um, to, to thinking about what a small state is. In, in the book, <laughs> and this is a bit of, uh, it, it's, it's a shift and you know, for some maybe a, a, a bit of a dodge. Um, what, what I do is I'm actually thinking about, about asymmetrical relationships and thinking about small states as the uh, as 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 states are that are the the materially smaller weaker partner in um, in relationships where there's a big material disparity this is kind of your traditional um, great power non great power relationship and you know I think that that allows me to do certain things in in the book in terms of trying to look at and compare uh, types of relationships. Um, that said, it's not perfect for all uses, and I mean I think this is an is is an area where where both. Um, you know, Emily and Wazim might, might have different views of what of, the, of how we should constitute a small state because, in a lot of examples, that sort of uh, smallness on its own can matter, right? It it can matter when a state uh, is it can, can field only quite a small diplomatic service. It can field only quite a small foreign service, and that means that it may struggle to have a representative at all of the different international organizations or the many, many conversations that are happening around the UN, it may struggle to have a representative at all of those, um, even though its interests are at play, uh, because its, it's foreign service is too small. It, you know, it, it cannot field, it cannot afford to field uh, a foreign service big enough to do some of those things, to maybe take, a, take advantage of some of the opportunities that I try to, to highlight um, that, that might exist for small states in, um, in in certain types of cases. And, and so that really forces those states to prioritize um, and to make difficult choices about where they're going to stand, send their representatives and how they're going to commit their, 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 their resources. So, you know, I think both of those elements sort of uh, smallness and stateness um, matter quite a lot. And so those are, that's a little bit about kind of how I made, made, made the choices that I did in, in, in conceptualizing small states in, 
in that way, but you know, like with any concept, there, there are different ways to approach it, which might capture some things and 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 miss others. Great, thanks. Well, so there's a question here from Maurizio. Um, what kinds of strategies are small states deploying? Um, and then in parentheses, emulation, creativity, et cetera, uh, so that they get um, international attention. Maybe we'll focus on this emulation part of this question. Maybe start with Wazim, sort of, how do you see small states sort of learning from one another, learning from successes and failures in the international system as they sort of plot their own strategies? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, you know, I, I see that, you know, Emily had mentioned the you know, success of particularly Caribbean leaders that, you know, the way they've reformulated sort of how we think about climate change and and, and Tom mentions it in the book. And I, I see that Caribbean countries are taking the same approach to other global issues, right? We saw it during the pandemic, right? Using the UN, using the WHO as international platforms, you know, specifically Prime Minister Motley of Barbados, using this as a platform, you know, to basically talk about, you know, the pandemic and the way that we have been talking about climate change for the past 20, 30 odd years. Um, now we're seeing it, you know, with Russia's war in Ukraine, you know, Yes, Russia's, Russia and Ukraine, that's on the other side of the world for the Caribbean countries, but now the conversation has shifted to high energy prices and to high, you know, high food prices. Um, and so them using this similar strategy of as small countries that, like, like Tom just mentioned, you know, might not be able to take advantage of some of the other diplomatic avenues. For example, if you're a Caribbean ambassador in Washington, D.C., you're often also the permanent representatives of the OES or the non-resident ambassador to Mexico, which means that you, you simply don't have the resources or the time or the bandwidth to, to work with all three of these partners or organizations. Um, so that means that global platforms like the UN now become much more important, right? There's much more emphasis on how you can use it, which is why climate change is brought up, the pandemic is brought up, you know, the effects of you know, high energy prices is brought up. And we're even seeing it in spaces like talking about global reparations, right? Caribbean countries are leading the charge on this because they're, they're not talking about it day in and day out, but they're using specific instances. They're being much more strategic. They'll mention it at the UN, if the royal family visits Barbados, visits Jamaica, this is gonna be a point of discussion using media to their benefit, right? International media outlets using CNN World, BBC World to be able to talk about these issues in a global scale without having to have a, a permanent representative or ambassador day in and day out trying to move the needle on this process. So that's, you know, and, and it speaks to the point before is, you know, what is a small state? It's, it's, you have to consider the small state circumstance. One is, you know, not having a lot of members of your foreign service, but another part is just, how do you, you know, how do you work with other countries just being a small economy, right? You know, the Taiwan, you know, Taiwan was brought up. Why does Taiwan still have allies in the Caribbean? Well, the reason is they have small economies and Taiwan doesn't really have to do a lot in order to have an effect um, in these Caribbean countries, right? You can donate 10,000 homes to Barbados because that equates to, you know, like 10% of the population, for example. So I, I think, you know, they've learned, you know, as being, the, this is the identity of being small is how to use these global platforms to advance their own agendas, or maybe sometimes it's not even advancing agenda, maybe it's just starting a conversation. Um, we saw that with climate change, we're seeing it now with global reparations, and I'm sure we're gonna see it um, in, the in the coming decades. Thanks, Emily. Your thoughts on this, especially this question of sort of learning. I mean, you, you did raise it earlier, but just curious. Yeah, I mean, one other thing I was thinking about, which um, I think um, the small states, small, um, small and developing states are really taking a kind of leadership role in um, kind of moving the, the agenda forward and um, on something that, you know, hasn't shifted for quite some time. Um, I kind of alluded to it before, but is really around the kind of aid effectiveness. And, um, you know, there's long been this kind of um kind of narrative that um you know with enough kind of development assistance um over time countries will um increase their income um or capital levels they'll graduate they'll no longer need development assistance and then they'll be independent and will no longer re like require um that that kind of support um and i think um SIDS have, have, have their experience and um, um, the way they've kind of engaged on this topic um, internationally is that 
that is not working. It doesn't work. Um, they graduate out of um, uh, official development assistance and immediately kind of amass very high levels of debt. And um, I think they've been very strong um, on, on this agenda and, and, and sort of turning back to um, the, the uh, international financial institutions, the donors, and saying, you know, this is not working. First of all, this these criteria, the eligibility criteria um, for um, receiving this kind of um, aid is, is are wrong, and the, the GDP per capita kind of metric is is, and is not the right one, um, because they can be, you know, the, the GDP can easily be wiped out by an extreme weather event. Um, so then they're kind of um, back to where they were before. Um, and of course, it hides um, inequalities and lots of other issues associated with development. But I think particularly the debt issue is, is important. So I think, you know, they've they've been extremely influential in kind of putting that more to the attention of the um, the OCD countries and, and the main donors and, and making sure that, you know, that's now being looked at. And, and there is a multi-dimensional vulnerability index um, which is being developed and taken a lot more seriously now. And there have been organizations working on it for years, 20 plus years, but it's really, I think, in the last two years that it's really beginning to kind of gain some traction. Um, and that is due to the experience and the way um, that small states have kind of framed the problem. So um, I think it's it's kind of um, being able to use evidence of the specific situation um, more effectively um, in, in the right discussions. Um, and and I, mean, I, I think behind the scenes as well, probably having um, uh, discussions with some of the, the kind of the main donors, some of the OECD countries um, to, to get this kind of onto their radar. So that was just another example that I, of, you know, as a really important issue around which I think they've been influential um, in, you know, putting forward that, the, that very special kind of situation that they're in and making it kind of clear why the aid and the development system needs to work differently for small states. So Tom, um, Wazim and, and Emily have both used the word uh, leadership um, as they, um, in their remarks and, uh, and reference particular leaders. Uh, we, we've been talking about states um, and strategies by states, but of course these states are led by people uh, and it matters a lot as we know in our own countries uh, what, uh, you know, who the leader is and just maybe give us an example, one or two, you know, individuals that you think, you know, are, are really um, emulatable uh, or should be emulatable uh, uh, out there, uh, leaders of small states? Yeah, I mean, I think this leadership question is, is a really, is, is a really important one. I mean, if leadership is important to, to, to a great power, in a sense, you know, it's even more important to, to, to a small state uh, to be able to kind of to recognize these opportunities to respond to, to pressures to develop particular, uh, particular relationships. So, I mean, I, I, I guess I would say, um, but before kind of answering your, your question about examples more directly, you know, you know, one thing I try to be a bit careful about in the in the book um, is actually talking about leaders and um, talking about the goals of particular leaders because I think it's easy in in a lot of in, in a lot of IR, but maybe particularly with small states, to sort of assume that achieving the goal is kind of a normative good. Right, and, um, and of course, leaders are pursuing their own particular uh, goals, which are often, and what they perceive as, as being the well-being of the, of, of the state they lead. Um, but, but of course, they might also have things like their own kind of regime survival in mind. Um, they might have, have their kind of benefits that they're seeking to accrue to themselves in mind. So, I mean, I think it's also important when we're kind of thinking about and contextualizing the, the the, the goals of small states um, that those goals are kind of read through the lens of of, of different of different leaders. Um, so kind of some of the the classic examples that ha have been have been talked about quite quite a lot um, are. Uh, are around the issue of climate change. So, uh, so Tony De Brum is an example who, who's often cited um, for for something that um, that, that uh, Jack Corbett, who's a professor at Southampton, and his co-authors have have termed the competent performance of vulnerability. 
And, and I think that this highlights some of the some of the points that, that Emily and Wasim are talking about as well, which is that um, th that small state leadership often has to uh, has to get those two things right. It has to balance those two things. On the one hand, uh, showing and making larger states care about them and why they're quote unquote vulnerability um, matters to them, but but also doing so in a way that is extraordinarily competent, that is that that is resilient, that shows a great deal of capacity and, and innovation, et cetera. Right. And, and so this is something that AOSIS and and um, and and different small island groups around climate change have have done have done really well. Um, you know, one case that uh, that I looked at, that I've looked at quite quite a lot, kind of in the historical record, has to do with Panama's position in the negotiations with the United States. Uh, and so this was a, around the return of the Panama Canal Treaty in in the 1970s. Uh, and so this was a government, uh, an authoritarian military government, that was renegotiating something that it certainly saw as both in its own interest and in in the the interest of of Panama. But did a lot of these these things really well, kind of uh, making the United States reconceptualize the issue of of of, uh, of what a secure Panama Canal meant, bringing a lot of other states alongside um, with with uh, with Panama, so kind of attracting the support of first other Latin American states and then states around around the world. So I mean, I think that's kind of um, a, a historical example. And then just one one other case that I wanted to cite because I, I think it's kind of it still is ongoing, but but um, but but uh, it is certainly of interest is around questions of, of small arms trafficking in the Caribbean. So this is an issue that has been of, of really great importance um, and demonstrates a lot of the dynamics of asymmetry where an issue that is of kind of rather marginal importance for, uh, for the United States, that is arms that are spilling out from the, the giant US arms market have really devastating consequences in, uh, in small states or around the, the region. Um, and so there's been uh, sort of a quite astute mobilization and uh, kind of finding common platforms, finding allies. Um, and I, I should also mention small states uh, relationships are not all with other states. So they're often with say NGOs with whom they might have shared interests, NGOs that can provide resources and expertise, et cetera and help them uh, Im improve their, their position. And so we, this is another area that there's been, um, been some progress in terms of, of trying, to, uh, trying to develop a diplomatic response to, to this big problem of, of sort of, uh, of, of weapons spilling outside of the United States market and, uh, and, and, onto, and onto their streets. Great, thanks. Well, we have two minutes left and I'm gonna ask you a big question, but ask you for a relatively short answer. Uh, I do want to mention there is a comment from Anne that I'll just read. It's not a question, but it's an important comment, which is, it appears that successful small states out of necessity learn to use and leverage limited resources smarter, a lesson large states could learn from. Uh, well said. So the Biden administration came in, the president you know, has talked a lot about, we're at an inflection point in history, it's democracy versus autocracy. Um, and, you know, uh, obviously the United States, for the United States, main challengers like China and Russia are authoritarian states. From your perspective as someone studying small states, do you think that this effort to talk about the world as democracy versus autocracy is a helpful way to uh, characterize international politics going forward? Uh, no, I, I don't. I mean, from the perspective of the United States, say, trying to, um, to, to, to bring states on board, you know, I, I don't think that, that it's necessarily all, all that helpful. And I think in generally um, enunciating this kind of Manichaean us versus them uh, view of world politics, Cold War redux um, is, 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 can be quite perilous for small states. It creates an environment um, in, in which 
sure, sometimes you can leverage this competition for to gain certain resources, but it also really um, increases the, the risks. And being sort of pushed to define uh, exactly which side you're on in this kind of ideological struggle, I think really can increase the, the risk for small states. Well, this has just been an incredible discussion. Uh, Emily and Wazim, thank you so much for taking the time to join us. Really appreciative of New America and Heather Herbert and Alex Stark for the opportunity to partner. And Tom, so excited for you with the release of this book and wishing you much, much success with it. And um, I'm very hopeful as I, I was thinking as we were going through this, um, this session and the fact that it's recorded, uh, I hope it will get much use uh, in classrooms uh, across the world. Uh, as people want to think about the role uh, of small states and the way in which they can uh, have influence and try to be more effective in achieving their goals uh, in world politics. So thanks to everyone um, and, uh, and have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much.